Tonight on News Vision, the Cloisters cluster continues. All students have now moved into their apartments, but so have some unexpected guests. We will have a live update on the situation. Plus, who let the dogs out? One dog breed is finally out of the doghouse in Miami-Dade County. Our neighbor's dog uh, was outside and uh, immediately. And later on, the Canes basketball teams go international. In two of the games, the starters played 22 minutes and the subs played 18. These stories and a lot more on tonight's episode of News Vision. It starts right now. Good evening and welcome to News Vision. I'm Andrew Klein. And I'm Regina Potenza. Thank you for joining us. Two weeks ago, News Vision spoke to students who are affected by the Cloister's Miami apartment delay, and today we have some new information to share. Harvey Duplock is back live at the Cloister's. Harvey, what's going on? Regina, I am here in front of the Cloisters Miami, and even though they may not or may not have updated much, we certainly have some updates to share with you. First, just after News Vision aired our first investigation or report, I should say, into the living situations here, or should I say the lack thereof, uh, the moving date was delayed a final time, this time until last Friday, which means students were living in hotels for five days weeks. Next, some students have told us they've been forced to leave their apartments from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. so workers can finish construction. Construction that should have been completed before anyone moved in. There were also reports of construction workers having open access to people's apartments. They've been going in whenever they want and leaving the doors open for the entire day. Next, some students have actually had to flee the apartments to go back to hotels due to the dire conditions here. Sewage is backing up into people's bathrooms. We do have a photo of it from social media, but please be warned, it is incredibly disgusting. Those living in the sewage field apartments have been moved back to hotels until at least October 4th. Finally, there is an alleged class action lawsuit being filed against landmark properties, the owners of the Cloisters Miami, as well as the standard at Coral Gables. But guys, the students living here are not the only people being forced from their homes. One grandma in North Miami was forced to tear down the tree house. She called her tree home for nearly 20 years. I was able to go up to North Miami, see the tree house and so much more. You're being so nice and quiet. Good girl. 72 year old Shawnee Chassa calls herself a hippy dippy tree hugging grandma, but she does more than hug trees. She lives in them. Started a long time ago. I lived in teepees. I traveled around the country in my van protesting the war and other things. The last thing I wanted to do was live in a tree. But what is it about living in a tree house that makes it better than an actual house? Everything from the trees to the flowers, to the rainstorms, to the croaking frogs all night long. She has lived in tree houses since 1990, but in 2006, she bought this amazing property in Miami for her son, Joshua. He needed a house. So I found this house and I went, this is the house for him. He's going to love it. And when he went through the gate, he said, Mom, I want to live here my whole life. And he did. In 2009, Joshua died from a sudden heart attack. He was just 32 years old. And since then, Shawnee has lived here to keep his memory alive. And over time, she turned this treehouse into a tree home where she lives all the time. But what about the actual home on the property? Well, she rents that out to friends. Oh, it's beautiful. It's like paradise. I mean, it's beautiful. This was what Josh loved. I mean, this was his, his paradise. Now, this tree house is incredible. It has a working fridge. It has running water. And it even has a working oven. But officials from Miami-Dade County say the structure is illegal and they want it gone. Since 2015, they've been fighting with Shawnee to tear down her treehouse because she never got approval for any of it, something she does not deny. Uh, all not permitted, but legal. But the county does not agree with her. They told the Washington Post that when building on your property, you have to do it by the county's standards and regulations so the homeowner is kept safe and you're keeping your neighbors safe. 
At first, they offered to help fix the property. They would have contractors walk through the property and help get rid of the current buildings, then have professionals rebuild it with permits and up to code. But after eight years of not complying and $70,000 in fines and other fees, Shawnee finally gave in. And on Monday, September 18th, the demolition started. And although the treehouse might be gone, Shawnee is not going anywhere. Put a mattress in the living room, have fans go and open the windows, and if I get claustrophobic or an anxiety attack, I'll just come out in the middle of the night and stay in that nice little swing. For UMTV, I'm Harvey Duplog. Thank you, Harvey. And Shawnee's treehouse is not the only thing coming to an end. On October 1st, Miami-Dade County will end its 34-year-long ban on pit bulls. Ryan Marshall examines how this new bill will affect the dogs, the shelters, and the residents. This is Bubba. He's a five-year-old mixed-breed dog living at the Big Dog Ranch Rescue in Loxahatchee, Florida. Bubba was found as a stray in Miami, but because of a 34-year-old bill that banned pit bulls, it would be illegal to own dogs like Bubba as a pet in Miami-Dade County. Yiki, yes. The ban on pit bulls was passed in 1989 after eight-year-old Melissa Marrera, her mother, and her grandmother were attacked by their neighbor's dog in their driveway. Our neighbor's dog uh, was outside and uh, immediately jumped on me, knocked me over. Um, I, he bit pieces of my forehead, my scalp, um, with his nails, almost took out an eye, and also uh, my lip was hanging off. And Miami-Dade County moved fast. Just weeks after the attack on Melissa, the Metro-Dade Commission voted unanimously to outlaw pit bulls in Miami-Dade. And the ban left animal rights activists like Lori Simmons upset for many years. They're very, very misunderstood breed. It should never, ever be about the breed, it should be about that specific dog. But now this ban is coming to an end. In June of 2023, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed Senate Bill 942, which prohibits breed selective legislation in Florida, which means that on October 1st, the bill will go into effect and all local ordinances discriminating against dogs based on breed will be overturned. And while this repeal will allow previously banned breeds to be adopted here in Miami-Dade County, the new law does not apply to private landlords, apartments, or HOAs. This is a nationwide problem that we're facing as far as overpopulations across all shelters in the nation. We have noticed that maybe cost of living has something to do with it. A lot of um, buildings in Miami have restrictions as far as what type of breeds can be owned, which unfortunately a lot of bully breeds are affected. By that, I really hope landlords and homeowners, when they're setting these rules, assess each dog individually before they continue to ban breeds that cost dogs lives. And while many are glad to see the ban end, victims like Melissa are worried for the future. I think that once folks now start acquiring the animals more frequently because of the repeal, that there is a likelihood that more people will be attacked. She hopes the state will reconsider the new bill in the future and leave the decision to the residents. I'd, I'd ask that you know people take into consideration the danger that they're putting out there, um, especially in Miami-Dade County, that you know people that own these dogs are not realizing the harm that they could do to so many others. But for now, the end of the ban means dogs like Bubba may be able to find a new home in Miami-Dade County. Ryan Marshall, UMTV. Back here on campus, dozens of students gathered for an annual event that took place last week. 134 companies and graduate schools set up booths at the Watsco Center for the annual career fair. But to get in, many students had to wait in line for more than 40 minutes to even talk to businesses and schools. Once in, it's definitely students received a long minute. line. Um, I wasn't expecting it to be this long. And they spoke um, to I have class representatives in from all different minutes, areas, so from ranging I from am STEM kind of jeopardizing to that class. But I feel like in my position right now, it's something that I have to do. Students received their name tag and spoke to people in all areas, ranging from finance to STEM to government. Students talked to companies about summer 2024 internships and job opportunities as well. 
Over the past five years, suicide rates among U.S. youth have been on the rise. One organization in South Florida is doing its part to help lower that number after a tragedy of its own. I went to one event they recently held to see how they do that. He was such an amazing person, and through this foundation, events like this... 17-year-old Sienna Alvarez Coyle lost one of her best friends sure a year ago. Her friend's name was Kennedy Bailey. Kennedy was only 16 when she took her own life. We went to school together in seventh grade, and then I had always done 5Ks once in a while for fun. So then Kennedy and her dad just mentioned like going to a, a track club in Miami Gardens. And then we went, and I was super nervous, but she introduced me to everything. And then we started going every day, going to meet together, practicing together, and it honestly made me fall in love with the sport. Kennedy, she was a phenomenal personality, human being. She had a lot of friends, and she went out of her way to make people feel safe and loved and accepted. To honor Kennedy, Sienna decided to organize a 5K run in Miami a year after Kennedy's death, in September, which happens to be National Suicide Awareness Month. The event was sponsored by a foundation called the Kennedy Kids Foundation that was started by Kennedy's father, former UM football star Robert Bailey, to raise awareness about mental health and suicide prevention. Um, we're here to help, and there's a lot of resources. And we, you know, we don't want you going through this. We don't want families going through this. So reach out you know, to your parents, reach out to organizations like, our, like ourselves. More than 500 people showed up for the race on September 17th, a significantly higher turnout than originally expected. We were honestly aiming just for 150 to 200 people. Yesterday, 133 people registered last minute. It was insane. So I'm so happy with the turnout. I can't believe that this many people came, but it shows just how many people care for this cause and care for Kennedy. It means the world to me that people are willing to uh, talk about it and address the mental health uh, situation among our teens today. According to the National Alliance on Mental Health, suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people aged 15 to 24 right here in the United States, where some 5,000 people take their own lives each year. And the Baileys are trying to urge parents to prevent that from happening. Be hyper aware and don't take it for granted that it's just a phase or they're just having an emotional moment. Take it seriously. You know, talk to your kids, you know, ask questions, get them help, get therapists, take them to therapy, stay on top of them daily, uh, every day when you recognize there's something going on. And for Sienna, it is also about keeping the memory of her friend Kennedy alive. It means so much to me because it feels like I still have a connection to Kennedy and I feel like I'm still helping her even though she's not here with me. I feel like I can still feel her through all these events and seeing the happiness that it puts on people's face and now that I know I'm making a difference and this is what she would have wanted, it makes me feel great. The 5K was the first of many events that the foundation plans to hold in the near future. If you want to support the Kennedy Kids Foundation, you can log on and donate at kennedykids.org. Now we have to take a short break, but when News Risen continues, Vice President Kamala Harris visited one university in Miami as part of her college tour called Fight for Our Freedoms. And an ongoing controversy at Zoo Miami is heating up. These stories and more coming up. Stay with us. Observe a domesticated human family in their natural habitat known to their species as the backyard. Hey, you think I should light it now? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Oh dear, someone is about to burn a pile of debris that's too tall, which can start a wildfire. Wait, could it be? Blimey, oh, it is. It's Smokey. It's Smokey Bear. What a legend. Hey, it's Smokey. Sorry, it was too high. Right. Watch as he astutely ensures that there's no wind and how he removes some of the debris to create a smaller, safer burning pile. No, you, can't make it no, you can't make it bigger, baby. The bigger, the better. Take note right. of our fearless okay. furry friend here, yes. humans. I appreciate it. Fist bump. <laughs> Watching you. Smokey's done it again. Bye, Smokey. Only you can prevent wildfires. Thank you for staying with News Vision. Whether he's working on Capitol Hill, in Latin America, or South Florida, Frank Morris says he will always be thankful to the U. 
Earlier today, the University of Miami Hanley Center Democracy Center hosted the U.S. Ambassador to the Organization of American States. Mora, who is a UM alum, discussed U.S. relations with Latin American countries, his roots in Miami, and his extensive foreign policy experience. Mora says his connections to South Florida and the U have made a profound impact on his career in politics. When I was in graduate school here, uh, half the class that I came in with was from Latin America, Colombia, and Ecuador. So as part of that exposure, critical exposure, I think was very helpful. Ambassador Mora also offered some advice to Keynes looking to learn more about a career in politics. A big day for young voters in Miami. Vice President Kamala Harris visited Florida International University this afternoon. It was the sixth stop on her college tour called Fight for Our Freedoms and the first in Florida. Daryl Barnes is live from the campus of Florida International University. Daryl, why is the vice president touring these schools and why FIU? Harris has been touring HBCUs and schools with large minority populations for about the past month. Her goal, to empower and encourage young voters of color. And FIU is the single largest Hispanic serving institution in the country. Harris took the stage for a chat about 3 p.m. moderated by rapper Fat Joe and actor Anthony Ramos. Harris answered questions about gun violence, abortion rights, and climate change. But her main point, encouraging young voters to express their concerns and telling them that if they vote for the Biden administration, that they will answer those concerns. Next stop for Harris is the University of Wisconsin next Thursday, or next Wednesday, that is, as she rounds the halfway point of her Fight for Our Freedoms tour. Live from Florida International University, Daryl Barnes, UMTV. Thank you, Daryl. Zoo Miami is a great place for families to visit, and soon it could be making a big splash. Melanie Lowe explains. Zoo Miami is the largest zoo in the state of Florida. The zoo occupies almost 750 acres and is home to more than 2,500 animals across a variety of species. And soon, it could be home to another huge attraction. Miami Wilds is a planned water park set to be built in the parking lot directly adjacent to Zoo Miami. The original plan, which featured the water park, a hotel, and theme park, was approved by Miami voters in 2006. But since, it was discovered that the development of this park could negatively impact Miami's Richmond Pine Rocklands, which are home to endangered native species such as the Florida bonneted bat and Miami tiger beetle. And even though the construction plan has since scaled back to only feature the water park, conservationists have been vocal about the environmental impact. Here's the bottom line. You can put that water park somewhere else. You can't move this critical habitat anywhere else. If the water park fails, the water park fails, they'll build another one somewhere else. If we lose these species, if they become extinct, all the money in the world is not going to buy them back. But those in favor of developing Miami Wilds say there is no issue with the park's placement. Officials did not return our requests for interviews, but in a statement to WSVN 7 News, Paul Lambert, one of the Miami Wilds partners and developers, says, quote, there's not one square inch of Pine Rockland that is being impacted by this project today or any time in the future. Every square inch of this project, of the Miami Wilds project, is being developed in a paved parking area. The Miami-Dade County Board's vote on the proposed water park has been deferred several times because of court challenges and conservationist efforts. In an interview for the Miami Herald, Miami-Dade County Commissioner Keon McGee, who's the sponsor for Miami Wilds, says, quote, all of those things are subject to what the court has to say. If the court rules in favor of the water park, then the conversation is over. They have the right to be there. McGee even emphasized the economic benefits of the park, saying, quote, the South really needs this water park as an economic engine. Some student organizations at the University of Miami have been working to spread awareness about the environmental impacts and are encouraging others to do the same. Go to the hearing in December, say, look, I don't want this. I want to keep this native species, this Pineland Rockland area. I don't want this water park. Tell your elected officials what you want on the county level because they'll listen. Public opinion about the water park construction is mixed. Some residents think the water park is a good idea. Water is keeping the kids cool and happy. Yeah. We take our grandchildren to the water slides all the time and the water parks mm -hmm. be fun. Well, the bat moving I have heard about. Mm -hmm. In Australia they have that issue too. And the bats can rehabitate. So I'm okay with the bats moving. But others believe the native species should take priority. Well, I don't want nothing to happen with the bats. 
I would choose the bats over the water park. Florida has enough water parks for children, so it doesn't have to be right here. The Miami-Dade County Board is set to take its final vote on the construction of Miami Wilds on December 12th. And I firmly believe there's a small chance to make history here. This is, could be a historic vote, and if it goes the way where they say the water park takes second seat to the environment, it'll be a statement, not only by our commission, but by what the people have been able to do by showing our elected officials. Melanie Lowe, UMTV. Well, Regina, after hearing about Zoo Miami, I think we need to take a News Vision field trip to the zoo. I think so, but it might be a no-go with today's weather. I hope this weekend's looking a little bit better. Well, to let us know, our meteorologist Charlotte Carl's live in studio to bring us the forecast this week. Charlotte, will we be able to go to the zoo? You know, maybe not Saturday, but we can all head over there on Sunday. As for right now here in South Florida, we are humid but warm still. Low set or excuse me, upper 70s in Naples. And then as we travel over to the East Coast, we're in the mid 70s, 85 here in Miami and Marathon. Tracking out our rain over the next few days, we're going to start tomorrow off with a few spotty showers just like today. And then throughout the afternoon, we're going to see those showers really develop in the interior parts of Florida. Those will push to the East Coast. We'll see scattered showers throughout the afternoon. Saturday, very similar setup, although some of us will see less rain. And then Sunday, we are going to see less rain as well as we are going to see a slight drop in humidity. These red colors, those indicate higher values of humidity or tropical moisture throughout the area. You can see this cold front. It's not quite coming to us. It's going to actually fizzle out over the middle of the state. The good news is behind it, we will get those blue drier air intrusions, which will feel so nice. It's going to feel closer to what our temperatures actually are. So let's take a look at those dew points. Upper 70s, these are really uncomfortable. When we get into the low 70s, that's when it's going to feel really nice outside and it's going to feel like Miami. Quick check of the tropics. We have two systems we're watching. We have Philippe, currently a tropical storm. And then we also have Rena, recently named, neither of which are heading towards us. But what is heading towards us is your seven day forecast. For the weekend, we have chances of showers Friday and Saturday, upper 80s, mid 70s for your low temperatures through the middle of next week. Wyatt? All right, Charlotte, thank you. The Miami Hurricanes men's and women's basketball teams are back in their practices this week, but not before taking trips overseas to never forget. More on basketball at the U right here and much more with sports after the break. Every day, thousands of kids start vaping, and I can't let this happen to my kid. Of course, it's awkward to talk to your kids about the dangers of vaping. Hey, bestie. How sketch is me? It's hard to get their attention. Ready? Go. Yes. Look at that. Yeah, you, you, you didn't turn yours over. So if you want to talk to your kids about the dangers of vaping, you have to get it trending. Right, Backpack Kid? Let's do it. First, invite your kid to do the vape talk. Let's try this. All right. Why is he here? Yeah, I got to get it trending, no. honey. Come on. Let's go. Honey, can we talk? Yeah, what's up? I see a lot of your friends vaping. Visit talkaboutvaping.org for tips on when and how to have the vape talk. Hello and welcome to sports. I'm Wyatt Copeland. For the first time since 2017, Miami football is 4-0, and the Hurricanes went on the road for the first time this season. Let's go up to Philadelphia to see how the team won. Now, Tyler Van Dyke, the quarterback for Miami, said he was an Eagles fan growing up, and he played dominantly at Lincoln Financial Field. This time, Colby Young, the wide receiver, going top shelf to make this one, and Miami got out ahead once again early in this one, looking very much like a different team this season. Second quarter winding down, Tyler Van Dyke once again trying to look at his options early on. He goes to the Ole Miss transfer in Henry Parrish. Miami scored the first 24 points in this game before Temple would get just one touchdown going into the locker room break. That time Parrish going for 13 yards. He's used to it by this point in the season. E.J. Warner finding the end zone that time for a quick score for nine yards. Miami with a dominant win wasn't finished in the second half as it's now 4-0 for the first time since 17 over 500 yards gained. And staying on the turf, but this time with soccer. The Hurricanes won their second ACC match of the season against the Louisville Cardinals at Cobb Stadium on Sunday. Miami and Louisville were scoreless until the match's final three seconds as freshman Reese Wheeler scored a, 19th, a 90th minute goal. Excuse me. 
The St. John's Florida native's first college score gave the Hurricanes their first win over the Cardinals in seven years. But more challenges await Wheeler and the team as Miami's back on the field against number two ranked Florida State tomorrow at 7 o'clock. We move indoors to spotlight two winning basketball programs at Miami as the NCAA's men's and women's basketball tournaments became more than just another trip for the Miami Hurricanes. But traveling across the United States weren't the final stops on their travel agendas as they flew over the Atlantic Ocean this summer. Texas first six minutes. Oh, nicely done. Basketball for Miami's men's and women's teams is nearly one month away. But while they spent their summer preparing to win national championships, it also brought the chance to fly to Europe for their first foreign tours in four years. I think last year we were so good because we were, you know, we judged so good on the court, but also off the court. You know, we, we spent a lot of time together, and I think this trip helped us, you know, spend a lot of time together, get to know the new guys, make the new guys get to know us. But the Hurricanes knew they weren't leaving for just a vacation. In the NCAA tournament last season, the men went to the Final Four for the first time, while the women made history by going to the Elite Eight. With three games for the groups, men's basketball played in France, and the women did two in Greece and one in France, as they each used foreign soil to learn more about how they would work together with new teammates. We played a, a strict professional team that was so very good, and, and we got up, and then we got down, and we fought back, and we won it in the fourth, and I thought, my God, for, you know, we had barely anything installed, and... I was really impressed with the grit and how competitive the team is. In two of the games, the starters played 22 minutes and the subs played 18. So it worked out very well for my staff and I to take a look at where we are. After they returned to the U, the team said their trips only helped strengthen them before tip-off this fall. Obviously, a lot of teams didn't go to go in there, but just on the court, it really showed a lot about how this team skill set is going to be and how we will run the floor as a team and what is needed of each person. It's a new team, so any chance you get to play like real live action with each other, it really helps out. You get to learn your teammates, the tendencies, coaches, and everything, so it just makes you more familiar with the, with the program. And even though their seasons will not come until November, Miami's teams know their trip at least gives them a head start on preparing for their new seasons. And before we go, South Florida has grown to love Miami's basketball teams this year. And one American music star has felt a romantic tick for one tight end and his NFL team. Music artist Taylor Swift went to the Kansas City Chiefs home game against the Chicago Bears this Sunday. And not just to see football. According to multiple sources, she was there to also see Chiefs star tight end Travis Kelsey as part of a developing personal relationship. Swift's sighting during kickoff gave Chiefs fans and the rest of football more than just good spirits at Arrowhead Stadium. The Chiefs won their second straight game with a 41-10 win over the Chicago Bears. And that wraps it for Sports Tonight. Andrew? Thank you very much, Wyatt. Time for another quick break, but just ahead, an actor who portrayed a beloved character on the Harry Potter movies has died. News Vision will be right back. I don't know why you're so sad. You've got a roof over your head. You gotta stop with that depression stuff. That's a white people thing. You all right? It just feels like it's coming from everywhere. Do you want to talk about it? You can talk to me if you're feeling sad. Whenever you need to talk, I'm here, okay? And finally, the most beloved Hogwarts headmaster passed away yesterday. Michael Gambon played Albus Dumbledore in six of the eight Harry Potter movies. Fellow Harry Potter actors, including the Golden Trio Daniel Radcliffe, Emma Watson, and Rupert Grint, as well as J.K. Rowling, have already taken to social media to express their condolences. The magical mentor inspired millions of children over the past two decades for his beloved role in the Harry Potter franchise. Gambon was 82 years old. You know, Andrew, Harry Potter was a staple in my household growing up. The books, the movies, it's sad to see that we lost Gambit, but he really inspired many people across the world for his role as Albus Dumbledore. Yeah, just an absolute legend, an incredible franchise, and he'll be greatly missed throughout the cinematic universe, throughout the Harry Potter universe and fandom as well. Yeah, were you a Harry Potter fan growing up? Personally, I wasn't. I read the books, I read a few of the books, but I was not somebody who watched all the movies. But now, I'll go pay my respects. I gotta go watch those movies for sure. For sure. Yes. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of News Vision. Thank you for joining us. Don't worry. We'll be back next Thursday right here, same place, same time. Have a great night.
speed will be overturned. And while this repeal will allow previously